added, I must say. Um, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 17, uh, uh, beginning in verse 15 through uh, verse 20 for you this morning. Uh, there is gold and an abundance of corals, but a precious vessel are the lips that speak knowledge. And 16, take away his garment when one becomes surety for a stranger and for a sinner impound it. 17, food gotten by deceit is sweet to a person, but afterwards his mouth is filled with gravel. 18, plans are established with counsel, so with guidance make war. 19, he who goes about as a slanderer divulges Secrets, so do not get involved with silly chatter. And 20, as for the one who curses his father and mother, his lamp will be snuffed out in pitch darkness. Okay, here's the way I'm going to teach these proverbs and what I think that they are saying to us in a very practical way. Verse 15, physical wealth, spiritual wealth, and the vast difference between the two. Physical wealth, spiritual wealth, and the vast difference between the two. 16, our obligation is to love not loan. Our obligation is to love, not loan. 17. The mouth that brought the deceit will no longer work. The mouth that brought the deceit will no longer work. It will no longer be functional for work. That's the idea. 18. Plans that last and are successful come with good counsel. Plans that last and are successful come with good counsel. 19. Stay clear of people that are not loyal. Stay clear of people that are not loyal. And finally, 20, grave consequences for those who dishonor their parents. Grave consequences for those who dishonor their parents. Well, here's our exposition for the morning, beginning in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 15. And this is a proverb with a surprise. Uh, you know, Roy Orbison said, if you want to have a hit, you have to have a surprise in the song. Well, here is a proverb with a surprise. Fantastic material wealth here in line one is compared to wise speech in line two. So what we have here is that which is good offset by that which is actually better. Line one, there is gold. Gold valued just like today for its metallurgical and aesthetic quality and quality and quantities. Uh, and look at this, in abundance of corals. So that's vast wealth being described Jewelry, which was a commodity in the ancient world that stood for cash and certainly stood for wealth. 
Now here's the surprise in the proverb. You see the but? Well, that's not a contrast. It's actually a comparison. Very unusual uh, that, the, that the tiny fragment in the inspired language would be taken that way. But it is the comparison of that wealth with the precious vessel. Now, the precious vessel, not of value like jewels, but no, this is a reference to an all-purpose object, something that you say, well, I, I just, I can't live without my phone. I can't live without my computer. That's what this is, the precious veg vessel. Uh, now, the proverb. The proverb states, as important as wealth is, as important as something that you can't live without would be, this is the object that is to be most preferred. Lips that speak knowledge. That would be speech that conforms to the moral education that the parents are delivering to the child in the home in the teaching and the instruction that the book of Proverbs is providing. And that teaching, of course, is the power of God in the lives of those young children in the home. And that is of far greater value than the riches that one could acquire in the ancient world. That's what the proverb is saying. So let's think that through for a moment. The, the lips, the mouth, the voice, the mind of a Martin Luther, what did that mean to Germany? That one man, look at the difference that he made to that country. How about Albrecht Zwingli of Switzerland? A, a genius, no doubt. Uh, his ability to understand the text and to think through it and then to become a political figure of sorts and lead people in the knowledge of the truth. An unbelievable man, Albrecht Zwingli in Switzerland. How about Amy Carmichael in India? Uh, she changed that country, uh, taking orphans off the street and providing for them and taking on the political establishment uh, that she did by her presence, by her power, and by her prayers. Amy Carmichael. How about John Calvin? You look at a map, everything west of Geneva is under his influence. He changed the face of the planet. All because the man taught the word of God in the city square in Geneva every day of the week. And what happened? Well, it's amazing. Just from a secular point of view, all of these Lines go back to this man, John Calvin, in Geneva. You have a bank account because of him. You have private property because of him. You have public education because of him. If you had a child that you wanted educated in that day and time, you had to take them to the bishop of the Roman church because you see, they were the only ones that could provide a proper education for you scholastically. And so Calvin was taken to the bishop by his father who couldn't afford an education for him. But the providence of God is always at work in all of these things. That's why I appreciated your thoughts about Afghanistan this morning, Warren, because God is working in ways that we have no understanding of. And what happened at that time, 
Calvin got scholastically what you and I would call the ground floor of a good education. Uh, Latin, Hebrew, Greek. Uh, uh, he was exposed to the scholars of his day. But then something happened. Always keep your eye on providence. King Francis went to war against Charles V of Spain. And he lost. And he was taken capture. Well, what did that do? It put, it put the king of France, mother, in charge. She had a heavy hand and was a powerful Catholic and hated the Reformation. What did that do? That suddenly took all the reformers that were in France and after a few martyrdoms, they spread all over Europe. Can't stop it. Can't stop the word of God. You can't stop regeneration. Now it's spreading like wildfire everywhere. And what about John Calvin? It took him out of that Roman education and moved him outside of Paris and outside of the Roman influence altogether. The providence of God is amazing and it's the power of the knowledge of God. That is supreme. What's the difference between material wealth that's talked here in line one what is the difference between vast material wealth, products that you desperately need, I've got to have my car, I've got to be able to do this and do that, this is a necessity in my life. What makes the knowledge of God superior to all that? Here it is. What's the most powerful element in all of the universe? The knowledge of God. Why is it more powerful than the nuclear weapon? Because the nuclear weapon cannot change the heart of people. The Word of God does. That's who Martin Luther was. That's who Albrecht Zwingli was. That's who Amy Carmichael was. That is who John Calvin is. Changed. Not renewed, changed. And the world has the ripple effects of the power of a changed life in the life of history. And that's the proverb. Here's 16. Take away his garment when one becomes surety for a stranger and for an outsider impound it. You know, we have talked about surety and being surety, a guarantor, and the book of Proverbs has already denounced that. So I'm not going to rehearse all of that with you this morning. Uh, this proverb is almost uh, translated in verbatim in 2713. Uh, the, just to get the structure of the proverb, for you who are really becoming students of this book and studying them, that you have really four elements, four people in this one proverb. Let me point them out to you. Now, first is the audience. That's the listener. That's the student in the home that hears. And that's who we are, in effect. Secondly, there's the debtor who is identified as a stranger. So he outside the covenant community of Israel altogether. Third, there's a creditor. He is not the member of the covenant community who would practice any kind of kindness, covenant loyalty toward another. And fourth and finally, there's the guarantor who stands behind the debt. Now that's what the Proverbs force is telling you. Don't be a creditor. Don't be surety for one. So how do I conduct my Christian affairs? Well, here's the way I do it. I'm under obligation to love you. 
not to loan to you. Uh, I am so indebted to so many people here at this church. What am I doing running around trying to collect on a debt when I am so much in debt to them in the first place? No, we don't behave that way. We don't think that way. Uh, the life of a believer in the New Testament, he's constantly giving out time, attention, money, what can I do? How can I serve? May not be able to serve and fix every problem, but I certainly want to give time and attention and be helpful to do that. That's my responsibility to you in every occasion. I want to talk for just a moment because these words come up. I want to show you, give you a visual picture of surety because it's essential to you and I understanding the gospel. But I want to use it in an Old Testament context. And you're familiar with the story. It occurs in the tent of Jacob with all of his sons, absent, of course, Joseph. And the father, Jacob, sends his sons down into Egypt because they have lots of food there. And so off they go. And here they show up in a line like everybody else to get food, but they notice something among themselves, that this powerful man that they have to meet with, he treats them totally different than he does all these other Bedouins. These other Bedouins, he's kind, he's generous, he's gracious, to, but not these brothers. He calls them spies. He locks them up. And then, letting them go, he keeps one of them as a surety, as a ransom, to make sure that they'll come back. And so they load all of their grain, they go back to their father, and in their father's tent, and they open their sacks, and they're telling this story about this very hostile kind of man down there in Egypt. Man, he is tough. And they open their sacks and behold, there's all the money that they paid for the grain. It's in their sacks. Now, how did that happen? And Simeon, their brother, is gone. In order to get more food, you've got to bring baby brother Benjamin. You've got to bring, you've got to go back in the land and get Simeon to bring him home. All these complications. And that's when Jacob in the tent said, all these things are against me. I've lost Joseph. I've lost Simeon. And now I'm going to perhaps lose my baby boy, Benjamin. All these things are against me. When we know the story that everything was working for him. Everything down to the tick of the clock was working for him. But here's the good part of the story. See, they're down into getting ready to go back down into Egypt. And Jacob pushes little Benjamin forward. He's going to go down, be away from his father for the first time. And... Judah steps forward and says to his father, I'll be the surety, I'll be the guarantor for this boy, your youngest son, my half-brother. I will be his guarantor to get back to you. So Jacob lets him go. They get down into Egypt. Now they're ready to meet Mr. Intimidator. And, but it's totally different. Well, there's a banquet prepared for them in this man's house. And there's Simeon. He doesn't look like he's been in any prison. He's got the suntan lotion on, you know? He's enjoying Egypt. And then they have this banquet in the house of this strong man. And lo and behold, they look around and look, all the place settings 
are all in order of their age. Now, how did anyone know to do that? And then they came to serve, and baby Benjamin gets a double portion. What's that all about? Well, they load up their sacks of grain. They're back on their way to their father when suddenly all the Egyptian officials surround them again. Somebody has stolen our master's cup. Well, there's no thieves among us. We wouldn't do such a thing like that. Matter of fact, we came back and replaced the money that we found in our sacks from our first visit. We wouldn't steal a thing. Well, let's just open the sacks. Everybody's sack was clean, and then came Benjamin's sack. And guess what fell out? The cup. Oh. The official said, you guys can go on. We're taking him. Oh, no. No, no. We'll all go back. And so they do. And they face this powerful man in Egypt again. And they've got the cup. And... So, so the powerful man says, why did you steal from me? And the young boy said, I didn't. I didn't have anything to do with it. He said, well, you'll, you'll be my servant for here on. And that's when something very significant happens in your life and in my life as a result of those few moments. Judah fourth son of Jacob steps forward and he says I'll be the surety like I pledged to my father I think of the pictures here Old Testament pictures I'll be the surety I'll be the guarantor that I pledged to my father that I would be for another I will become your slave permanently. Let this one who is obviously guilty go home. And that's where it all changed. Because suddenly the strong man in Egypt, he screams out and he tells everybody to get out. And he's left alone with these brothers. And then he begins to weep. And he says, come close to me. I'm your brother. Now, I wish somebody had, would do a giant mural, mural of that moment to see the faces of those brothers, eyes this big, jaws on the floor, in concrete. Be a marvelous picture and a great point of drama from the Old Testament. But here's what happened. Judah, the fourth son, became the surety for the other. He became the substitute for the other. He became the guarantor. He became the surety for the other. And the second thing that happened at that moment is he became, by that announcement, the lion of the tribe. That's when he, figuratively speaking, took the scepter in his hand. Now, it wouldn't be known and it wouldn't play out that way for a long time into the future, but that's when it occurred. When he stepped forward and became the surety for another, the substitute for another, the guarantor for another. I don't want you to leave this proverb without understanding that word. It's an important word in our salvation. Because from Judah 
comes the kings, comes David, comes the line, and in the end of the line, identified as the last prophet of the Old Testament, there he is, the lamb. There he is, the one we've all been waiting for. Surety. One other quick word here that I don't want to miss in the, in the proverb is the word garment. Why is that important? Well, garment, garment actually is very important in our salvation as well. This word is found in 1 Samuel 19.13, and let me tell you the quick story. David is now going to be arrested by his father-in-law, Saul. And Saul, you know, one of these midnight runs on like the FBI breaking down the doors. We've seen those pictures before. And so here come the soldiers. And David's wife meets him at the door. Says, no, he's sick. He's sleeping. Oh, okay. So they go back to the king. Well, the king blows his top. I gave you an order. Oh, now they're rushing back. And they go in. And she says, he's sleeping. And they look over. And they see this figure covered by our word, a garment. Same word. And they pull the garment back and it's an idol. And what's the point? It gave David time to flee away. Keep your eye on David. He's going to become the great king. And this is how God rescued him at this time. Using a garment to one day become king of all Israel. Aren't these words fabulous in what they teach us? Here's 17. Food gotten by deceit is sweet to a person, but afterwards his mouth is filled with gravel. The proverb opens with food, the necessity of life. It could be obtained, says the Proverbs, by labor, by promotion, by inheritance. Here, notice it's gotten by deceit. Food, livelihood, something that would be a necessity for life, but it was actually done deceitfully. Something not in reality, actually different. We call it bait and switch today. Now, the word sweet used in the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 14, of a sweet voice. See, this person can really tell a convincing story, a compelling story with that voice. The person here would be the liar, the one who by deceit misrepresents. But here is a contrast. And look at that word afterwards. It's an interesting word. Temporal, literally, it refers to time and place. But you translate it behind. Isn't that interesting? Afterwards means behind. So let me illustrate it this way. You have the stage and you have the big thick curtain standing behind the characters on the stage. And what's behind the curtain? Well, it's winches and chains and all this dirty, greasy stuff that makes all this stuff in and out flow. And there are people back there with dirty hands and, and dirty overalls. And they are the ones that are making the changes that are necessary so that when the curtain opens, we see the scene. And it all looks so pleasant. That's the idea of the word behind. How great are the words of this proverb. They are astounding to me. And that's the word behind. So here it comes from the mouth. Filled. Means there's no more room. No more room for anything else. 
Look at this figure gravel, small rocks that pack the mouth. So much so that this liar, this deceiver, now his mouth no longer functions because it's packed with this small gravel. So there goes his food, there goes his livelihood, and all because his ability to speak deceit has now been cut off from him, removed from him. God has worked against his mouth. That's the consequences of the liar and the deceiver in the book of Proverbs. It leads to a miserable end. There is a very short rope for the, in the book of Proverbs for the liar. Here's 18. Plans are established. Now, what a wonderful word established is. When you see the word established in the Old Testament, just mentally say Psalm 11, verse 2 to yourself. Because that's the word. It's used of fixing an arrow to a bow, a string on a bow. It's fixed. It's set. It's in place. It's established. That's the word. Established with counsel, so with guidance make war. Wisdom, the skill for living, is never impulsive. I'm impulsive, but this book teaches me not to be. Careful with guidance, and then we act. Our proverb here pertains to being teachable. Are you teachable? We take counsel before we take action. That's the idea here. Plans are established. There's the word again, fixed, used twice, with counsel. What's counsel? Informed by the scriptures. Informed by morality. This is what you need to do. This is the right thing to do. Go turn yourself in. Don't leave the scene of an accident. That is good instruction, moral instruction. Now, our salvation hung in the balance over this term, counsel, guidance. Here it is, the book of Ruth. Our salvation hung in the plans and the counsel of one Naomi who had a daughter-in-law who was a Moabitess by the name of Ruth. And she gave her this counsel, Ruth chapter 3. You go secretly, don't let anyone see you, to the threshing floor. And there you wait in the dark in that place, unnoticed. And after the evening, revelries are over and the threshers all lay down to sleep for the evening. You find Boaz and you go lay down at his feet and you uncover his feet. And when he wakes up, you propose marriage to him. Now, you want to talk about a lot of twists and turns. That's counsel. That's counsel from Naomi to Ruth. But here's the important verse for us all. Ruth chapter 3 and verse 5. She says to Naomi, I will do whatever you say. She followed the counsel. And what happened? Divine providence was working. Boaz and Ruth were married and they became a quintessential link in taking us to the Messiah. Ruth chapter 4, she gives birth to Obed. Obed is the father of Jesse. Jesse is the father of David. And so here we go. The providence of God moves us on. Plans established by counsel of the wise. They stand the test of time. 
So, look at line two, that very important particle, so, with guidance, so meaning exactly the same way, with guidance, this is specific, counsel, advice for war. Now, what about warfare? 319 occurrences of the word war in the Old Testament. Conflict carried on by force of arms. It's for kings to contemplate about advancing troops outside of one's borders for war. He should examine himself. He should examine his priorities. Is this morally correct? To do? Is it consistent with the scriptures for one to do this? That is the idea of warfare. And to do it, you need lots of careful prayer and guidance and wisdom. And that's the proverb. Here's 19. He who is about goes about as a slander, divulges secrets, so do not get involved with silly chatter. A proverb for our day and age, certainly, the inveterate gossip divulges secrets, so stay clear of people like this. People that are fools. Because of their mouth, they separate relationships. They disrupt a community, which we never want to be involved in. Disruption if at all possible. They are dangerous for society and they're dangerous for national security as well. The words, uh, this word translated by the English Standard Version, if that's what you are looking at, it goes about. That's a very good translation because see, it really leans upon behavior. This is the way people really behave. The verb is literally to go about. Now, here's the way it's used, and it's a beautiful picture for you. First Kings chapter 10. It's used of the Queen of Sheba when she comes and visits Solomon. And remember, she brought all kinds of gold and all kinds of spices for trade. And where did she collect them? She collect them by going about to this place, picking up a load, to that place, picking up a load. That's our word here, going about. And that's how it is used. And notice the word slander revealed here as hidden information. It is valuable. It is important. To have secrets. Secret information, important and valuable for national security purposes. It's horrible that people would take the elements of security for this country and publish them for our enemies to see them. It's morally wrong. And I can defend that by the Bible. Here's the way I would defend it. In warfare, in warfare, there's no such thing as lies or deceit. Not in warfare. Not when lives are at stake. Not when we have to protect people. You see, the midwives in the book of Exodus were blessed of the Lord because of their deceit to the Pharaoh. Oh, we would have gotten that baby boy so you could have thrown him in the river. But uh, the Hebrew women are vigorous. We never had time to get there. That's what they told him. That's warfare. We wanted to kill them. Get rid of them. And God honored their lie and their deceit because it was the righteous thing to do. Here's another one. Rahab, she kept secret the spies of Jericho. How about 1 Samuel 15? Hushai, the archite, was sent specifically by David back to Jerusalem. 
and to Absalom in particular to work secretly to pass information back to him. He acted like he was Absalom's friend when in fact he was his enemy and giving information back to David. Here's line two. So do not, a command from wisdom, here associate. The word is literally to walk. To walk in fellowship along with one who has silly chatter, who talks and divulges things. It's literally the word to open one's mouth, to open the lips of the mouth. That's the word. And it's careless and malicious speech, not guarded, not protected. Just remember that the book of Proverbs teaches this. To keep a secret is loyalty. It's loyalty. Proverbs 11, 13. To keep a secret, the Proverbs say it's an act of love. It's a way to define love. You see, I need to be loyal to my master in heaven. And in being loyal to him, you are the beneficiary. Because I subsequently must be loyal to you. But it all starts with him. Loyalty to him. And the outworking of that is loyalty to you. So I, as God would give me grace, keep my mouth shut. And that's the proverb. We're out of time. We'll start with 20 next time we're together. What a blessing to be back with you. And what a blessing to be in this book together. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your great faithfulness to us at Believer's Chapel. Thank you for the Word of God, the power of the knowledge of God that's more powerful than anything in this universe because it changes people. It regenerates people. The heart of man that's desperately wicked, now becomes clean through the knowledge of God. And that is a miracle, something to behold. Bless the elders who oversee us, the deacons who serve us, and thank you for the testimony that they render to us daily by preserving this place and the content of this place to the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen.